Um, I'm really glad that they played that uh, last video, uh, mainly because I didn't want to directly follow the mayor of Braddock. He's a very great, powerful speaker, and I'm slightly scared of him. Uh, <laughs> but it, it relates a lot to what my talk's about. Um, I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to absorb, because it's a lot of words up there. Um, and it is a challenging talk, um, because why come to TEDx? Why bother leaving your house if not here for challenging talks? Um, so I'm going to deliver a lot of data to you very fast. It's exciting data. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Maybe not so much everyone in the audience, but maybe the internet people at home. So um, someone out there is excited. Um, I'm mainly going to be talking about having pragmatic faith um, in startups. So what does it mean to have pragmatic faith? Uh, my idea is, is having faith in the seemingly impossible. Um, to get yourself in this mindset, um, imagine you're Nansen Mandela, jailed at the heart of apartheid as a civil dissident. Would you, behind your jail cell, looking out across your country, be able to envision one day being president of the country that possibly just jailed you for life? No, that's ridiculous. You're in jail. It's impossible. But do you stop? Do you give up? No, you keep moving on. And it's those kind of impossible problems I want to challenge you with. Because we deal with them every day in our day to day. We, we often just discard the impossible and focus only on the tiny box of the possible. Early on in my career, I was given an impossible problem. Um, I was headhunted uh, by the CEO of Touchtown, they're based in Oakmont, to start a new subsidiary where the brilliant idea was let's take dance arcade games, you know, like Dance Dance Revolution, those things that uh, young Japanese teeny boppers spaz out on. Let's bring that to like old people with balance issues and frail bones that hate loud music. And let's just mash those up in a way that will benefit senior fitness, senior health, making exercise gaming systems for seniors. On the face of it, it sounds like a terrible idea, which is what I told the, the, the guy who hired me originally. Um, but since he was paying me, I had to kind of figure out a solution. <laughs> so as you see, we have a lot of safety features, balance, a lot of ways um, we were delivering data metrics in a partnership with UPMC. Uh, similar systems are now being used um, across the world in retirement communities, senior living centers. Um, the Wii Fit stole some of our idea. So it, it's, it's a much more mainstream concept now, but we're really pushing up against the barriers of the possible. And I think that's a lot of what being um, a serial entrepreneur is about, especially um, a social serial entrepreneur, one that is trying to make a net positive impact on the world. You're really kind of pushing up and defining the possibility space and trying to create sometimes literally value from nothing. Um, after uh, Dan Sound was acquired by Cobalt Flux, it was summer of 2008, and the Sichuan earthquake had just occurred. Um, that's where I was born. I was born in central China, um, actually at a hospital not far from here that probably doesn't exist anymore because you can see the scale of devastation. I didn't really know what to do. I went back there, uh, obviously, to help out with my friends and family. And I started working with some relief workers and NGOs, and I was hearing the same concern, especially once the global economy collapsed in later that year in the fall, that institutional giving is at an all-time low. Um, we're losing so many funders. We're barely keeping afloat. But there's still need throughout the world. The world doesn't stop. Disasters don't stop happening just because someone screws up the financial system. So how do you get donors? How do you get tangible funds to the people that need them when we're in the worst recession of our lifetimes? We had to just create money. Um, I, we came up with a concept called couch change. When I travel, um, I travel pretty frugally. Um, I've gotten a lot of compliments about, about this, but this is actually from a thrift store. I had a friend embroider, um, like that Malcolm Moore song. I, I, I try to basically get as much as possible without well, having a small footprint. And I got the concept because when I travel for business, I don't like to stay at fancy hotels. I like couch surfing and meeting locals. And oftentimes, you'll just find some loose coins around. And it's often not enough to spend, but hey, coin collection. But the idea of lost assets, the kind of things that you discard, that fall out of your pockets, exists also in tangible financial instruments. So we came up with a system that allowed people to convert abandoned gift cards, frequent flyer miles that were about to expire, other 
illiquid but tangible financial instruments and liquidate them on secondary markets to create immediate cash for struggling nonprofits. Um, it did quite well. We were um, acquired by giftcards.com, and just prior to that, we won the MIT 100K prize. So we decided on the like, let's just donate all the money that we just won. Um, so we were able to build and rebuild several um, schools and hospitals throughout central China. But there's still issues in central China and around the world in global health. Um, Dr. Kennedy did a great explanation of, of why this issue is so important. Um, mental illness is what we're currently focusing on. And these are just some statistics right after uh, the Sichuan earthquake of 2008. As you can see, the rates are extremely high, similar to like a war-torn area, higher than Katrina. Um, you're looking at at, at least 10% uh, suicidal tendencies. 10% of the population is literally on the edge. Uh, Post-traumatic stress and depression above the 20s. And the most troubling statistic of them all is four, more than 14% are not getting counseling. They're requesting, seeking counseling, and not being able to get it. And the reason why is there's structural inefficiencies in Asia, which I'll go into more detail about, that make this problem seemingly insolvable. We're really fighting on the front lines of mental health. Um, it's not a vague concept. It's people who are suicidal, who have nowhere else to turn, and they can't get the services they need, and structurally, very few people are offering solutions. The World Health Organization has estimated that if nothing is done, uh, the cold old burden, cost burden, of mental health diseases will constitute one-fourth the total health cost in China by the year 2020. And the vast majority of those are easily treatable mood disorders and, anxi and anxiety disorders. This is why it's so difficult in China right now. This is what it's like to check into a Chinese hospital. And even if you stand, understand both Mandarin and English, it's still gobbledygook. And very difficult to actually figure out how you actually get the service you need. Besides just the red tape and bureaucracy, there's just too many people to serve and not enough available mental health professionals. You go into, this is a shot from one of, not even the major hospitals, just a, a regional one. It looks like you, you just entered a train station during rush hour. Um, people are kind of jostling for position. And all of these have, people have dire needs and they are actually working against social stigma. These are the brave people who actually decided to leave the house and in a conservative society admit that they have a problem and seek treatment, but even then, they're not getting the proper treatment they deserve. This is a great quote um, from one of the researchers that we work with about why there's this structural issue about even if the current population of China is undiagnosed in mental health, but even if they were probably diagnosed, there would not be enough mental health workers to treat them. Because professional psychiatrists in China are like pandas. There's literally only a few thousand of them. So if you just take of just general ballpark math, with a population of over 1.4 billion now, you are literally looking for a one in a million type doctor. And the structural inefficiencies and the societal inefficiencies, the stigma in China is not just about having to deal with the illness, but there's also stigma associated with the profession. While you know, um, Dr. Forbes and Dr. Keener are highly respected, and not just because Dr. Keener has amazing abs, um, <laughs> It, it, in China, if you enter into the field of mental health, you are one of the least paid and least respected professions. So they've tried to solve the issue by bringing in programs from the West, Australia, to train doctors. But quickly they find that people just use that as a stepping stone to move into more lucrative fields, which is sad, like a lonely panda. <laughs> so what is the seemingly insolvable solution to this impossible problem? What we found out is if we can't find the doctors, we can't train the doctors, then we have to build the doctors. And it's not robots. This is just uh, a cute image that we made. And we're not quite there yet. But who knows in a few years. What I'm talking about is computerized cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, what that 
long phrase means is we've developed, in conjunction um, with Ultrasys, um, a type of online web, ther web therapy that scales very well. Um, we work with these British researchers, actually in the UK and spreading it throughout Europe. This is actually now the recommended course of treatment. When you go to your primary care physician, unlike the US, they're not going to over-prescribe you meds because they're not as influenced by big pharma. They're going to put you as, on as few meds as possible and give you a mixture of talk therapy and online CBT and other approaches to have a more comprehensive service. It also scales much better um, because if you live in a great country that covers all your health care, then you care about the efficiencies of it so everyone can get covered um, at minimal costs. Um, it's the, the actual implementation, I don't have time to do a demo, but the actual implementation of it is a lot like almost like an online course where we teach you a lot about mood management, uh, meditation, mood therapies, and, but you still have a clinical practitioner overseeing you. But it allows the clinical practitioner, rather than being at maximum able to see a dozen or two patients, they can see upwards of 100 patients through a scalable system that uses you know, video chatting, mobile reminders, et cetera, the latest technology, um, rather than the kind of cue and align and hope you can find a therapist. Now, we've begun the process of translation, localizing, adapting, um, but we're facing a major issue to get higher efficacy. While our initial translation is effective, um, helps break the cycle of negative thinking uh, among some of our most struggling patients, it is not actually culturally appropriate for Asia. In the US, we live in a very self-helpy culture, a very individualistic culture. If we have an issue, we can read an Oprah book. We can listen to Dr. Phil. We can focus on yourself and kind of move our way towards a solution because we're self-starters and have that initiative. Asia is a collectivist society. This data plot shows um, on the y-axis the relationship of individualism um, down at the bottom to collectivism. So you can see the US and the UK, where we're building the software out as, are some of the most individualistic, self-starting, me, me, me type cultures. While on the opposite extreme, we're currently doing stage two trials and quickly moving into Singapore and other Asian countries. They're on the opposite extreme of some of the most collectivist societal cultures in the world. And it even ties into the stigma of mental illness. Because in the US, while people might feel personally embarrassed about disclosing their mental health issues for fear of being judged personally, in Asia, it's more about bringing shame upon your family, the way you were brought up, or saying that your work is too stressful and you guys don't know how to deal with it. So it's much more of a collectivist issue. So how do we solve that? We're currently thinking about culturally reappropriating meditation and mindfulness. As you can see from these books, I think some of them might have actually been featured on Oprah, um, the idea of meditation and mindfulness is not new in the West. This was culturally appropriated um, by psychologists, social workers, clinical uh, types in that great heyday of counterculture in the 60s and 70s where everyone from Steve Jobs to the Beatles were going to India and China to seek their gurus. And it all kind of propagated back into the West. And as you can see, it's very Asian. It's Buddha, yin yang, some kind of vague tea ceremony thing. <laughs> like, cultural appropriation happens all the time. We're gonna take it back. We're gonna bring it back to China. And what, one of the issues is that some of it comes off as a little bit new agey, that you might be thought of on the periphery of science. But take this moment to meditate again, because every session now, I feel like you're gonna meditate. Another tricky thing is mindfulness. Now, mindfulness mainly exists as a philosophical concept right now in the West. It's very difficult to explain 
to lay people what it actually means without sounding very new agey and highfalutin. Um, this is the simplest graphic I could get to kind of explain mindfulness, where it's actually a, about a, a level of metacognition about your thoughts. So to kind of clear the clutter that we have in the day to day and live in the now and seek tranquility. Obviously, dogs are a lot better at it than humans. So next time you're bothered by having to walk your dog again, remember your dog's doing you a favor. I want to focus on this point of that, that science and religion are not necessarily at odds. One does not always have to contaminate the other. And a great quote relating to that is, um, the Dalai Lama has said once, if science proves some belief of Buddhism wrong, then Buddhism will have to change. Now, can you imagine the Pope saying that? Obviously not, because we don't have a Pope anymore. <laughs> but, but even if we did, I doubt he would say anything like that. Um, what I'm talking about, this idea of secular Buddhism, is taking the scientific aspects of religious practices, the ones that have clear histories of evidence, and using those to benefit the world. Now, I'm not a Buddhist. If, when people ask my beliefs, I say, I follow the Dalai Lama, but only on Twitter, because he has great tweets. You guys should all sign up. I believe that there's a lot of value, and it's getting more and more mainstream. One thing that's super mainstream is yoga, which is basically secularized Hinduism that a lot of people don't even realize. Like this flash mob in downtown New York, Probably the vast majority of them just thought like, this is what my group of friends does. We're going to do yoga. And they don't realize that yoga literally means spiritual practice in Hindi. Um, a lot of Hindus are actually trying to retake back the origins of yoga and let people know about that. But this kind of gradual secularization, taking the best components with the most efficacy in, in these religious constructs is a trend that we're noticing. Here's a great data slide um, that was done a few years ago relating wealth and, pros uh, wealth and religiosity, basically prosperity and the amount of religiousness in your country. Um, now, as you can see, it follows a nice kind of downward line here, except with a few outliers of the United States and Kuwait. Um, it's, it's data that we already kind of naturally intuit that um, socialized European countries are less religious now, while developing countries are still quite religious. And one theory that we have is that for millennia, for eons, humans, when we had an issue that we were struggling with, whether it be about our family, our health, a spiritual issue, we sought the local religious leader, whether it be the church, the temple, or, or whatever. And one should not discount that. Churches still provide a lot of the social structure soup kitchens, counseling. And as we move into certain countries like Indonesia, which is rapidly increasing in prosperity, but it's still highly religious and a blend of Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, it is very challenging. And we feel that you have to make efforts at cultural adaptation. So why not take the most effective courses of treatment that have been used for a millennia? But out here in the outlier, in the US, which is amazingly prosperous, but on our money, in God we trust, what does that mean for us? This is a great slide about just the difference between um, religious views of scientists and the lay public. Um, everyone's generally familiar with this, that uh, the US general public is a blend of Catholicism, Protestantism, and a, a very high amount of evangelicals, 28%. Well, scientists has one-fourth the amount of evangelicals. The vast majority are atheists, agnostic, uh, some other religions, and a lot of them just don't want to disclose. And it's a reality of the thing that sometimes science and religion is divorced, and sometimes that separation is good, like the separation of church and state. But one should know the population that you're serving. We're moving into an area that's tricky. Um, a lot of people don't like to talk about science and religion together. We're also working with the Chinese central government who really don't like us bringing up religious issues, even though we've shown efficacy of it. So we're really like teetering on the edge of innovation, literally. Um, 
And sometimes when you're on the edge of innovation, I like to think about this quote from Tim O'Reilly, who's uh, one of the leaders of the open software movement. He has this great quote about, pursue something so important that even if you fail, the world is better off with you having just tried. So I hope that will be your takeaway from this talk, that we all face challenges in our day to day, impossible problems, and some of them we ignore, and some of them if we actually have the energy, we seek head on. But when you're just like really teetering on the edge, you're feeling really unstable on the edge of innovation, you're, you're worried that you'll fall into the precipice, into the chasm. What is stopping you from just taking a leap of innovation? Because the difference between falling and succeeding is so small. You might land on your face, but most people will just get back up again and continue on, and it's not a big deal. So I challenge you all today to face your own impossible problems. And if you like what we're doing at MathMatty, share them with us. We would love to hear it. Use Twitter or our website, uh, because we love challenging seemingly insolvable problems, and we would love to solve them for you, because everyone has insolvable problems. The only difference is what do you decide to do Thank you.